according to your wish. According to your wish. My life is not my own. Once again, to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Well, after seven months, actually a little more than seven months, um, last week we came to the end of Matthew chapter 7. And as I said, this week we were doing a summary of the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching that we've been doing for seven months. It's like leaving an old friend behind. It's like uh, it's gonna going, be hard yeah, going down. It's going to get out of here. It's like going down and taking somebody to the airport and watching them go away. We, it's, it's just been a wonderful time. Uh, all of the teaching from the past seven months, every this is the 29th, I believe, or 30th, 29th to 30th part of this Sermon on the Mount study, is available online, will remain available online. So if you've missed any part of it, uh, you can go back and watch it. If you'd like to see something again, you can. You can invite others to come and partake of this, participate in it. Um, I, I just believe that we've all been blessed by the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to encourage people mm. to go back and re-look at and re-hear these studies. Amen. Because I know I've yes. been doing it to do Bible bites, mm. and it's amazing the amount of information and nuggets that are in here. There's, yeah, there's good stuff. Oh, my goodness. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Very and, good. and we've been blessed. Uh, we started this in Orlando, Florida. And over the past seven months... The teachings have come as we've traveled from not only from Florida, but from uh, Tennessee, from mm. Texas, from it's North Carolina, right from, from New York, from here where we are right now in the northwest of England, uh, up in the Manchester area, down in London. So it's been a real blessing. It's, it's been a real journey. And uh, as I said last week, you know, it doesn't end here. Mm -hmm. I, I pray that what you've heard in the Sermon on the Mount will stay with you and become part of you. That that word that's going into you will just bear fruit in your life. As I pray that it happens in mine, Amen. that it will continue to grow in our understanding. Amen. But I did wanted to take I did want to take uh, just this session to kind of summarize what we've seen over these past seven months. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit of a summary. I'm going to start and get right into this, all right, with this, with this statement, because if there's anything that I believe sums up Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount, it is this. A right relationship with the Lord will lead you to do what you should, God's commandments. After all, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. However, keeping the commandments or keeping the law will not lead you into a right relationship with the Lord. It will not result in righteousness. The law cannot save. The law cannot bring you to righteousness. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, Because the works of the law, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. That's Romans 3, 20 to 22. It's not about keeping the commandments. It's about loving him. Yeah. That is the law. That's right. <laughs> it is, Jesus said, the foremost command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. The law and the prophets were God's revelation from the beginning. Immediately after the fall of man, God gave a plan, showed a plan, began showing that plan. Mm -hmm. And here is God's plan. Abel offered a sacrifice of a lamb. And God was pleased. Abraham offered his only son, and God was pleased. 
but chose to provide a replacement sacrifice. And Abraham called the place God will provide. The Lord revealed his plan, his only plan, for forgiveness in the law in Leviticus 17.11. For it says there, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. See, so there can't be any forgiveness of sin. There can't be any atonement without the shedding of blood. But he revealed through the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 43, verse 25, the fact that he alone would provide redemption. When he said, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Logically, ergo, by his plan, he had to shed blood. So the plan to restore, to repair the Father and man, that's God's plan. So Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you've been revealing your plan. Since the beginning, since men fell, since Adam sinned and had to leave the garden because of that. You've been showing, Lord, because it's about your love. And you said that we love you because you first loved us. So I pray that through this entire study, we have grown in the one thing that is more important than anything. Our understanding of your love for us. And Father, we just thank you for your son, Christ Jesus who not only taught this sermon, but went to the cross on our behalf. We thank you, Lord God, that we have your word to show light, your light, into the darkness that surrounds us in this present world, Lord God. We thank you for that, and I ask you to bless our time here tonight in this summary. Oh, yeah. right. I want to, as a, as a little bit of prelude, you know, if you've been hanging out with us for seven months, you know I do little preludes, and okay. I want to talk about Something because we're talking about how you can't be saved, you can't be made righteous by the law, which indeed you cannot. I want to talk about Old Testament righteousness. Okay. okay? As a as a preparation for getting, you know, uh, summarizing and understanding the Sermon on the Mount. It says of Abraham, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited, credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham, long before Jesus Christ came along and found righteousness. David, a man after God's own heart. In that very same place in, in Romans chapter 4, Paul talks about David. He said, just as David, and this is verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also, Paul says? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. So Abraham and David both found righteousness long before Jesus Christ. David, let me just go into David a little bit, all right? I'm going to read from Psalm 32, verse 1. David said, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's basically what Paul was quoting, right? Why? Because Paul, David said this. This is Psalm 51, verses 14 through 17. David cried out to the Lord, Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness, O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Listen to this now. This is David. You know, we're going back 2,000 years before, or 1,000 years rather, before the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? He said, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
David knew that, David, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, knew that it wasn't about works. Right? That's right. In Psalm 40, verses 1 through 8, this is David again. David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. I, just, I want you to see that it was possible for these men of old to have understanding of God's plan before the quote-unquote New Testament, right? It talked in that verse about his cry. Right? Mm -hmm. What was his cry? Well, go back to Psalm 51, verse 9, and listen to this. It says, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. This was the cry, this was the prayer of David. He didn't think he could wipe out his own sin through offerings and sacrifices. He didn't think that he could achieve a right relationship with God the Father through any kind of works. That's what it's saying. Mm -hmm. But he's crying out to God Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities, trusting in God to be able to do for him what he was unable to do for himself. Right? right? Mm -hmm. This is a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And then the prophet Isaiah. Remember, because now it said, the law and the prophets. The prophet Isaiah, remember, he was cleansed in Isaiah chapter 6. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm a sinful man. When he came into the throne room of God and saw the Lord high and lifted up. He was cleansed by the pavement. Go check that out in John chapter 19. But he said those with understanding knew that doing wasn't the answer. Because in Isaiah chapter 1, it says, What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. So, you know, it didn't, this wasn't a new understanding in the New Testament. God had been revealing this through his word, through the law and the prophets, from, from as far back as you can go. Job, Job is considered by many to be one of the oldest books in the Bible, right? But here's what Job said in, verse nine, in chapter 19, verse 25. He said, And as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives... And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. See, there were those in the Old Testament times who understood even then what Paul would write about again in Romans chapter 2.29. He said, when he is, a, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Because this is the law. Deuteronomy says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Mm -hmm. There was a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. As the Lord promised in times long past through the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Abraham... David, Job, and so many others all looked forward in faith to an event that we now look back upon in faith. Right. Our Redeemer, and as Paul said, Him and Him crucified. You know, an interesting thing, and I don't want to get sidetracked as I tend to do, but the sacrifice that was acceptable that took, because remember, it's the shedding, it's not the shedding of blood, but it was the pre presentation of blood on the altar in the Holy of Holies, which was a, a copy of what existed in heaven. The lamb was killed to obtain the blood, and then the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the capareth, the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. In the same fashion, it was the spread, the, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. Right. But it wasn't until he got into heaven, into what is the true Holy of Holies, and, and offered his blood, sprinkled the blood there. That puts it outside of time and space. Yes. 
that puts the actual sacrifice. It's so, ongoing. So well, so. it's it's just there. It's in right. eternity, right? So David, Abraham, Abel, all these people look forward to the event. We look back at the event. But it is only by faith in Jesus Christ and what he did at that time that brings us a right relationship with God the Father. Mankind needed a Redeemer. Most definitely. And that's what about. <laughs> so, in the fullness of time, to the Jew first, right? Mm -hmm. Paul wrote to the church at Galatians. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. All right? That was to the, for the Jews. But then to the Gentiles. Paul wrote again, but this time I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2. He said, therefore, rem remember, he's writing to Gentile believers now. Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. The people of God became enslaved by their lack of knowledge of God and a lack of understanding of the very nature of God. Back in the time of Isaiah, God spoke through Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 13, and he said this, Therefore, my people go into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude is par parched with thirst. Not that? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't understand the nature of God. They went into captivity. They were, their honorable men were famished, and their multitude was parched with thirst. Well, Jesus said, the first thing he said when he started his ministry was that he came to set the captives free. He came to shed light on the darkness of man's lack of knowledge. He's the light of the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the needed food to satisfy man's hunger. He is the bread of life. He is the living water that once having drunk satisfies thirst forever. Isn't that what he said to the woman at the well? Yes. He came to teach man the nature of God and redeem our souls. What's the nature of God? Love. So the cure, that's the reason. The sickness, sin is a sickness. God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world to cure that sickness. Incredibly, and yet obviously, the people of God in the time of Jesus Christ, in that fullness of time, had been taught and trained by the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the lawyers, the scribes, the Sadducees, as well as by their traditions, to think that all God was interested in was how holy they looked. Hmm. This of the Lord who said and continually showed that he searches the heart while man judges by outward appearance. So, the people of God were in bondage to these traditions and teachings because they didn't know of God's love. We know love by this. While we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. This was the demonstration, the explanation, the understanding, the proclamation. I can't think of enough good adjectives that, that Christ came into the world in the fullness of time to die in our place for our sins. God will provide, mm. that that was all about a demonstration of God's love. Okay? So that sets the stage for understanding the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. This bondage, this hunger, this thirst that they were wrapped up in. Right. Now I'm going to read this, something that's been quoted probably a number of times in the 
this study in the past seven months. When Paul wrote to Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, his disciple, Timothy, in the second letter, the third chapter, right? Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, many of you, I'm sure that your Bible doesn't say God breathed, it says inspired, or but the fact of the matter is the Greek word that Paul used there specifically says it's theonoustos. It is literally God's breath. It is important to understand this. You know, I, this is one of the things that upsets me with a lot of modern translations. It's like, okay, you know, maybe people won't understand God breathed. Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. He didn't have life in him until God's breath entered him. God's word is that breath of life that we need. Without God's word, you're just a pile of dust. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now let's just talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, having spent a night in prayer with the Father, taught what we now call the Sermon on the Mount. And we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Just, just by the way, for your information, uh, they didn't make up and distribute brochures calling it that just before no. he went up there. Uh, just that That's what we would do today for sure, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Sermon on the Mount. Handouts. Now yeah. think about what Paul, I just read from mm -hmm. Paul, right? That all scriptures God breathed and profitable for, right? The Sermon on the Mount, it was reproof for the way his people were living, living out their relationship with him. It was correction of the way his people understood that the Lord expected them to behave. Mm. It was to train his apostles and his disciples in righteousness. Just like Paul says, okay, this is the purpose of the God-breathed word. This is the purpose that Jesus taught this sermon to his apostles, his disciples. It was the ultimate transition from looking religious to living righteously. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about in a word. Mm. Getting from this place where we try and look religious to where we are literally living righteously. We started seven months ago with the Beatitudes, yes. right? Yes, we did. Blessed are the poor. Right? The Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes. And they are not be happy attitudes, mm. as many have taught but rather they are the behavior and the attitudes that will fully express our right relationship with the Father. Behavior, attitudes, be attitudes, okay? Get that, mm. right? That right relationship with the Father is made possible through the work of Jesus Christ and then empowered by the Holy Spirit. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. I'm telling you the answer is always three because God made things in his own image. Yes, he did. And he, while he is one, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is the Father, Yahweh. He is the Son, Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. He is the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's a mystery beyond our understanding. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. The Sermon on the Mount is basically, that's it's the Beatitudes. The rest of the message is the drilling down, the commentary, the detailed instruction that Jesus is giving on how to fully live those blessings. Exalting Jesus that men might be drawn to him, bringing his presence into every place, and glorifying the Father before men. Okay? Mm -hmm. I want you to think of it that way. And I said, don't, don't forget that the Sermon on the Mount is a whole. So more often than not, we've just heard a piece here or teaching from this verse and this verse. There's a unity to this that is important, right? I think you've said before that it's been the, the Beatitudes and then God is explaining what they... That's right, right, exactly. It's almost, and then everything else in Scripture after that becomes commentary on what Jesus taught, all right? Exactly. All right. So Jesus is teaching his disciples how to break away from what had become common in the lives of the Jewish people and begin to live the expectations of the Father 
the behaviors and attitudes that should be normal mm -hmm. in the daily lives of every believer. Mm -hmm. We're going to go from common. You see, a lot of things are common. They shouldn't be normal. That's right. All right? You know, I, I'm not going to go back into this again because we did this in one of the studies about the man with the withered hand in Matthew 12. But we have come, there have been so many things wrong in Christianity, what we call Christianity for the last 2,000 years, that we've just come to accept it. Mm -hmm. Okay? What Jesus, that's what happened 2,000 years ago. What Jesus is doing is trying to break us away from that common and get back to what normal Christianity should look like. It should look like him, and he taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Uh, okay. The new attitudes of a transformed mind lead to a new lifestyle. New lifestyle. To a new behavior, unlike the world, and unlike the religious, but not the righteous masses. The result is a transformed mind that brings us to a place where we do indeed worship God in spirit and in truth. Yes. Because at the end of the day, that's where it's going, to get us to worship, right? Amen. Paul wrote and said this, and translations are important, but if you, if you look at this, I promise you, this is a faithful translation. Mm -hmm. This is from the New American Standard in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It is about just laying your life down and offering yourself to God, letting Him have His way. How sad it is to see so many people sing, I surrender all, when they should be singing, well, I surrender 20% or what? Yeah, and find something? He'll only take all. See, they're all or nothing. The teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount ends with the foretelling of the horror of the very religious people coming to him on that last day and being told that he never knew them. And then they are sent off into eternal darkness. His message ends with the uncompromising, unapologetic warning that if we don't act on what he has spoken then spiritual collapse and failure is the absolute outcome. <clears throat> the people of God today, as much as in the days of Jesus, and as much as in the time of the patriarchs, are bound by man-made religion that Paul warned against in his letter to the Colossians, in Colossians 2.20, talking about how, you know, do not taste, do not touch, don't do this, don't do this. And that has the appearance of man-made, you know, but it's man-made religion, yes, right? Yes. Jesus Christ is talking about a whole new mindset. Paul said, don't be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed into what? Into understanding the Sermon on the Mount. This is the mind that we should have. The simple, the obvious truth that is easily seen by those who, whose eyes are open, is that most of what is called the church today, most of what is called Christianity, bears little resemblance, resemblance to what Christ describes here in the Sermon on the Mount. That's a fact. Yes, it is. I mean, you know, it says, Paul wrote into the Corinthians, he said, love rejoices in the truth. If we will rejoice in the truth and not reject it and try and, and, try and shape it, to fit what we're what we're living, you've got to you've got to realize that. Uh, the conclusion of the account of the Sermon on the Mount is that the multitude were all amazed at Jesus' yes. teaching. Yes. And I believed, I believe now that all too many today who fill the pews of most churches on Sunday or or don't even bother would be all the more amazed at the message. Of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, if they were to hear it. Yes, I believe that amazement would be all over again. I, I do. <clears throat> and the fact is, people, hung, just like, listen, let me go back. They hunger for this. They thirst for this. They may not even know it. They People are desperately looking for answers. 
not to the world's problems. People, nobody cares. Well, I know something. When all is said and done, nobody cares about the world's problems. People only care about their problems. But we only care about world problems as it affects us. But the other interesting factor in this is that all the, of the, what he's taught works if you do it. If you do it. You know, this is something I've been teaching on here in England a lot lately. Talk about that three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And you don't have to understand all of this, no, okay? No. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of things in life that we use that we don't understand. I, I, I would imagine that most of you who just went, you know, just will go tonight and throw a light switch don't really understand how the power plant down the way or the nuclear power plant generates you. You don't have to. But you know that when you go through the switch, it will go on. So you do it. Paul said you have to believe in your heart. You have to confess with your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then, you can't be a, just a hearer of the word. You've got to be a doer of the word. A lot of people are looking to believe in their heads. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, it's like, okay, you know, God t told us through Solomon, in Proverbs especially, how we need to seek understanding, all right? But the fact is, faith is an assurance that comes from God, because it comes from hearing the voice of God. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from leaning on your own understanding or figuring things out. All right? So you've got to believe in your heart. Now, that can happen before you believe in your mind. That's right. But you've got to believe in your heart. Then it says you have to confess with your mouth. You have to choose to take what, what you're believing in your heart and make that the confession of your life. Because what you speak is what will steer the direction of your life. Once you've spoken it, you have to do it. There are the three things. You've got to believe, you've got to speak, and you have to do. But we have to train ourselves to do these things. Let's, let's just be honest. I mean, look at the history of Christianity for at least, you know, go back to the 300s. All you see is wars. You see persecutions. Persecutions of Christians upon Christians. You see things like wars with, you know, the, the Crusades that went on for, for hundreds of years. You see wars in, in North Ireland between the Protestants and the Catholics. You see, I mean, all you see, you see... Atrocities in Africa. The, absolutely, but I'm talking about done by quote-unquote Christians. Although we serve the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. How can this be? You see, the Inquisition that took place... A lot of people don't know, you know, the Inquisition didn't end for a long time. You know, it's not just ancient history. It went on until, I believe, the First Vatican Council in the late 1800s, when it was actually not, not destroyed, but it was transferred into another, I think, office of faith. And, but that's another story. Mm. But the fact is, our, the history of, quote-unquote, the church is horrible. People look at the church today, and they see us acting like the world, they see us saying things that don't line up with the Word of God, living things that don't line up with the Word of God. How can we be the light of the world? How can we be the salt of the earth if we don't live the Word that Jesus Christ taught? Because this is about righteousness. You can be religious without being righteous. Every part of the Bible testifies to that. Mm. If, if this study has any impact, it has to be that we examine ourselves, like Paul says, let a man examine himself, and say, are we living that love that Christ came to show us and teach us? And not just the people that love you. That's what he said in the sermon. Right? Are we loving our enemies? And you don't yeah. have to understand that. No, but can we break away from the religious traditions right. that are not based on his word and start living his word? Can we come to that place where we understand it's not about us it's not about us offering sacrifices that please God other than to present ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice. These are indeed the last days. You may not believe that, but you want to know something? If, if they are, your disbelief won't change that fact. And, you know, Peter, the Apostle Peter said in the last days, mockers would come with their mocking, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Like it's never going to happen. Well, I got to tell you, look around you and, and believe this. So many of the prophecies that had to be fulfilled before Jesus could come back that second time have been fulfilled. 
We live in perilous times. We live in exciting times. I keep telling people we're, we're blessed to live in exciting times. Spend time meditating on the Sermon on the Mount. If it's not from our Bible studies, just go back and spend time. You know, spend time in your own prayer life, going back to Matthew 5, mm -hmm. 6, and 7. And see the life that Jesus is, is asking us to live so that we can have what He desires in our life. He said, I came that you might have joy and that your joy might be made full. The religious people tried to put burdens on people. Jesus Christ came to take the burdens away. Set the captives free. That's right. Jesus Christ said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. There's so many false teachers out there today who are promising you abundance and calling abundance the things of the world. No. The abundance is a relationship with God the Father that is full and abundant and prosperous because that's what will give you joy. The scripture is the prescription. The scripture is the prescription. Well said, yes. I see. Yes. It's for healing. Yes. So I, I, I do want you to know this. That there's a lot, as Alice said, there's a, there's a lot that we have covered mm -hmm. in these seven months. But I want to promise you this. Because of the time constraints we've had every week, there's a lot that we did not cover. Yeah. There's so much more in the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord wants to say to you mm -hmm. that I surely wasn't able to. There's so much more in those three chapters of Matthew <laughs> that God wants to speak to your heart that I certainly am not able to speak That's to your right. heart. Spend time here. Understand that this is the time that Jesus set aside right in the beginning of his ministry to take the ones that he had just named as apostles and train them to live righteously so that they could go out and be used of him to glorify his name and to touch lives, both Jew and Gentile. God wants to use you. God does want to bless you. God wants, listen, but you don't have to work at that. But you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Where did I hear that? Oh, I think that was in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Where did I hear that? I think I heard that in the Sermon on the Mount. When these things become what is important in your life, your relationship with God the Father, when, when your desire is to start living that relationship mm -hmm. that he purchased so dearly for you mm -hmm. with his only son on Calvary, when you begin to trust him, as Jesus said, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about the world and the things of the world. Because you want to know something? You can't serve God and men. You can't have half of your heart set on the Lord and half of your heart set on the world. Jesus, in this sermon, is setting you free from the burdens of worry, anxiety mm -hmm. about the life that you have to lead. All right? He'll do it through you. We are the clay. He is the potter. He is at work to will and to work his good pleasure in our lives. All we have to do is present ourselves to him, a holy and living sacrifice. He'll do the work. He did all of the work through his son, Jesus Christ that was needed to repair us to the Father. Yes. Um, I really do want to encourage you, not only to spend time in this more and more on your own, but to encourage others to get involved. Like I said, all of these studies will stay up online on the Bible Talk website. Um, when, but when all is said and done, the one thing that is important above all else is that you take every word that you have heard from Scripture, treasure it, in your heart. treasure it in your heart, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. start to live it. Hallelujah. Start to practice. That's right. No, maybe it takes baby steps. Don't. I, I was sharing counseling with somebody, and you know, there was not spending enough time in the Word. And I said, don't, don't sit here and say, okay, I'm going to spend three hours in the Word tomorrow, you won't. because you won't. But you know what? Make a commitment. You'll spend five minutes in the Word tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. Make it a habit. Make it a habit. And then maybe, you know, you move it up to 10 minutes. You move it up to 15. Take those baby steps to get, to get going. God's desire in your life at the end of the day, and this is what I was sharing with somebody, is that you look like Jesus Christ. That's right. Not only is it His desire, it's His promise. Mm -hmm. You see, and I'm, I'm probably going to end with this tonight, 
if indeed it's night where you're watching. God formed man from the dust of the earth. Adam. Yes, he did. And then, like I said, he breathed life into him. But he formed him. Adam sinned. Well, I know something. Sin is a deformity. More, more than being crippled, more than being blind, sin is a deformity. So Adam was formed, he sinned, and he was deformed. The Father sent Jesus Christ into the world to reform us. Amen. Amen. Paul says then, okay, now what we have to do is be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we go from being formed to being deformed to being reformed to being transformed. But the goal of all of this, Paul wrote to the Romans and said, for whom he knew, pre, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son Christ Jesus. The goal of this all is to re restore us to that place where, like Adam before the fall, we look like God, mm. made in His image. Mm. I was sharing with the same brother that I was talking to this about the other day that. It doesn't happen all at once. I think it was Michelangelo. I could be wrong about this. Uh, you know, write to me at office at Bible Talk and let me know. That there was a sculptor, one of the Renaissance sculptors. I, I think it was this statue of David, but I'm not sure. The sculpt of, uh, sculptor of David. And somebody was asking him, how do you take a big block of marble and turn that into this incredible, magnificent statue of, of David, if that's what it was. And he said, well, all I do is look at that block and I cut away everything that is not David. <laughs> the way for God to bring you back to that place, bring you to that place where you look like him, where you look like his son, Jesus Christ, is to cut away everything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Amen. And I was just thinking that, you know, he is the rock, but we are the stones. Yeah, we're little, we're just stones. That stone yes. he just has to cut away yes. until he can see. So, but that doesn't happen all at once. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the sculptor doesn't throw a hand grenade at the, the marble block and all of a sudden, poof, there's the right. statue. Chip away, chip away, chip away a little at a time. So, so don't feel defeated or don't feel discouraged. You know, if... If you don't look like, wake up in the morning and rush to the mirror and look exactly like Jesus and start living totally, absolutely sinless tomorrow without any failing in your life, don't be discouraged. But do begin to chip away at the things in your life that do not look like Jesus Christ. And you know how you can tell? The Sermon on the Mount. Use the Sermon on the Mount as your guide to normal Christianity. How you should pray, how you should give, how you should forgive, how you should love, how you should laugh. How you, it's, really, it's your daily plan. It is, it is the, the plan for yeah. your life. So start to use this as a guide. Start to use this as the instruction. Because it's not only loving those who love you, it's loving your enemies. That's, you know what? It's, it's not only, I was going to say it's hard. It's not hard. It is impossible until the power of the Holy Spirit that's goes to work in your way. life. It's the only way. All right? You can't throw your entire life out and just trust in Him to provide everything you need, as He says in the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. unless you are powered by the Holy That's Spirit. Right. If you lack that power of the Holy Spirit in your life, yes, you know what? This is a great time. Right now, this is a great time. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, ask, That's seek, right. knock. And in the Gospel of Luke, which shows the same account, He says, you know, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit? Right. He'll give you the power that you need to live this normal Christianity. So in any event, if you have any comments, any questions, um, that you'd like, or you'd like to discuss this study on the Sermon on the Mount, do write to us, office at BibleTalk.com. And we will be going into new studies, covering a lot of different uh, topics. Mm -hmm. Not sure where they Lord, are. Yeah, not sure where they are, as the Lord leads when, yeah. we, when we go from here. It's been a blessing and a pleasure to spend this time with you. Oh, it's been a blessing and a pleasure for us to join together. Yeah. 
with Jesus Christ in our midst, yes. the Word who is made flesh and dwelt among us. And I thank God that He has the power to change our lives. So, Father, we do. We just praise you and thank you that you sent your Son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to bring us into righteousness, that right relationship with you, something that we couldn't accomplish with all the works in the world. There was no way we could do it, Lord, but it was your free gift to us. Not anything that we would work, lest we would boast, because we would, but just your free gift to us. Help us, Lord, to have greater and greater understanding day by day of the meaning of this message. Help it to be the burning desire of our hearts to live the fullness of the teaching of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you might be glorified, that people would see him in us, because they would see your love, which you've poured into our hearts, directing our lives. Mm. We praise you and we thank you. Yes. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit you sent to lead us into all truth. Lord, help us to love you more. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, until the next time, when we will be studying, <laughs> don't forget to tell somebody else and go out and tell somebody that Jesus, Jesus loves, loves them. You. God bless you and goodbye until next time. to come.